Αγαπητοί συνάδελφοι, καλησπέρα. Καλησπέρα στου συμμετεμένου, καλησπέρα στου συμμετεμένου παρόντε. I think it's a real pleasure for me, a great pleasure for me, and a real honor to introduce uh, once again Professor Alfonso uh, Davide, who was so kind to be with us today, physically, and who has uh, responded to our invitations, and uh, he is uh, so kind to be in the previous two years' uh, lessons. For graduate courses of our department. So, Professor David, I really thank you for this continuous support and your presence in, in, our, in our program. And also, because you are a nice speaker and a very, a very excellent, deep insider of biology. Uh, so, my, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful. Thank you very much. So, you will speak about two topics, uh, as in the previous uh, times uh, also. That one, that both of them are, are interesting, really interesting. The first one is uh, incident and management of, of other uh, events, CCP after IP contrast agent and registration, and how should the audience approach this topic, which is an everyday practice problem, it's a serious problem, most cardiologists. Don't like to think about that. Exactly. Yeah. And if, uh, if something happens in the department, they ask, please call it up, which is uh, not yes. good for the audience. Or the escape. Or the escape. So thank you very much for giving this lecture. Uh, and then there is a, a different lecture, a very different and very interesting concept about a modern based reconstruction hour of ECD, technical program, and now the value. I'm eager uh, to, to hear you in the second uh, part, which is very fun. And, and all, of, all, all of us will be able to get a lot of work with that. So thank you once again. Yes. Good morning uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor uh, Prosopoulos, Professor Atsidakis, to invite me again in uh, Thessaloniki. Uh, I really love Greece and these people, so it's a great pleasure and great honor to be here again. And uh, I hope that with this new topic, during this uh, radiological course, I can give you some advice that can be useful in everyday clinical practice. But now I think uh, it's time to jump in uh, the first presentation that is dedicated to the incidence and management of uh, adverse contrast agent in CT and how we should uh, manage in everyday clinical practice. Okay, as we know, the radiographic contrast media are a group of contrast of medical drugs that are used to improve the visibility of internal organs and structures on X-ray based imaging, such as the computer tomography. And obviously they are really helpful in differentiating between the normal and pathological uh, areas or in detecting uh, the focal lesion. Contrast agent, uh, agent obviously are fundamental in the clinical practice for the radiologist. And even if a significant improvement have been done in the last decades in order to make them safer and better tolerated, till now the risk associated with contrast agent have not been totally eliminated and therefore we have to know how to manage it. Don't forget that the incidence of adverse event injection uh, varying from 0.05% Till 3% of patients that undergo uh, non ionic contrast media. And what American College said that the adverse side effect from the administration of contrast media may vary from minor physiological uh, alteration events to rare severe life threatening condition. And for this reason, we should be prepared in order to treat them in the correct way. So uh, the aim of this presentation is to become familiar with the potential side effects of the agent in order to recognize them and treat them effectively and rapidly. 
So to do this, we have to gain an understanding the mechanism and pathophysiology of anaphylaxis. We have to identify the typical symptoms of anaphylactic reaction, but we have to be able also to explain and recognize the differences, the different symptoms between vasovagal response and through anaphylactic reaction. First of all, we should uh, uh, categorize the reaction into different group, the acute one and the non-acute. Acute means that they develop in the first 60 minutes after the exposure to contrast agent, while non-acute means that they may develop from 60 minutes till one week after the administration of contrast agent. And for this reason, we usually define the acute reaction as immediate reaction and of course within the department of the radiologist, while the delayed reaction are those that are occurring between one hour later and seven days later. There exists another important classification regarding the reaction to contrast agent that allow us to distinguish the immediate reaction in two main groups, anaphylactoid reaction that can be mild, moderate, or with severe symptoms, and non-anaphylactoid reaction that can be chemotoxic, vasovagal, and idiopathic, while the delayed reactions usually are represented by cutaneous one. Well, let's start with the definition of anaphylactoid reaction. First, the anaphylaxis is an immune reaction that is characterized by several serious allergic symptoms in response to a substance that is recognized uh, by the, our body as foreign as host or host, and we call it antigen. And so we can recognize the anaphylactic reaction that is an immune mediated EG response to the antigen. And so it implies a previous exposure to the antigen followed by a severe allergic symptom. And we have the anaphylactoid reaction that is a non-EG mediated response that present with the same clinical sign and symptoms of anaphylactic reaction, but do not imply any previous exposure. And the anaphylactoid reaction is quite typical after contrast media injection. For this reason, we should remember that the anaphylactoid reaction may occur unexpectedly, and we call it in uh, terms, in the Greek term, idiosyncratic. Well, the basis of anaphylactoid reaction are related to the histamine release. And we know that we have several uh, histamine receptor in the different organs. Therefore, the symptoms may vary from very uh, simple to severe condition. And the severe condition is represented or is due to the presence of histamine receptor in the vessel, in the blood vessel, and histamine receptor in myocardium. Therefore, when the histamine interacts with the blood vessel receptor, usually the patient may manifest the vasodilation, while when the uh, histamine interacts with the myocardium, the patient may develop myocardial depression and myocardial ischemia. And therefore, if we try to combine the vasodilation with myocardial depression, at the end, we have a really complicated condition represented by the uh, cardiopulmonary arrest. While regarding the non-anaphylactoid reaction, uh, the results from the ability of contrast agents to modify or to upset the homeostasis of our body, and usually they are dependent on uh, the physical structures and the properties of the molecule, mainly related on the ionicity of the molecules and on osmolarity. So it means that if we increase the amount of iodine or the amount of contrast uh, media that we inject, we increase the possibility to develop such kind of reaction that could be chemotoxic, and the patient may develop neurotoxicity that is transitory, cardiac depression, again, transitory event, or arrhythmia. And for this reason, we should look at the electrocardiogram and we have to monitor it. 
And how can we differentiate a chemotoxic reaction from aphylactoid anaphylactoid one? The chemotoxic reaction are potentially predictable and are more uh, a common event if we use a ionic contrast agent, while today in most of the center we use a non-ionic contrast agent. And usually the chemotoxic reaction are strictly dependent on the amount of dose and concentration of iodine. While in case of anaphylactoid reaction, they are quite, quite unpredictable and they are dose independent and are strictly related to the release of histamine. While regarding the vasovaga reaction, they occur as a result of increased vagal tone on the heart and blood vessel, and therefore the patient may manifest bradycardia, decreased blood pressure, also confusion, responsiveness. But we should not forget that the vagal reaction, in most of cases, are not related to the contrast itself, but are related to the CT scan because the patient may develop anxiety regarding the report or some anxiety regarding the needle puncture or abdominal compression and so on. And again, we should be able to differentiate the anaphylactoid reaction from vasovagal reaction. In case of anaphylaxis, the patient have a rapid pulse and the low blood pressure, while in case of vasovagal reaction, the patient has a slow pulse with normal blood pressure. And regarding the skin, in case of, of an anaphylactoid reaction, the skin is red and quite warm, while in vasovagal reaction is quite cold and the patient may have the pallor. The most important thing, patient with anaphylactoid reaction may have cough, urticaria, and itching, while the cough and the urticaria are not present during the vasovagal reaction. And according to the ESO guidelines, and according also to American College of Radiology, we are used to differentiate three different degrees of reaction. Mild reaction, moderate, and severe. And usually only the moderate and severe reaction uh, needs or deserve any specific treatment. Don't forget that the majority of these events are non-life threatening condition and uh, they uh, require, in most of cases, only observation and reassurance. While the severe and potentially life-threatening conditions are really, really rare, are really unpredictable, and have a possibility of 0.01% to develop after the contrast injection. And the most important thing that usually the, really, uh, the very severe event occur within the first 20 minutes after the contrast injection. And for this reason, all the international guidelines suggest us to look at the patient, to observe the patient for the next 30 minutes after the contrast injection. So we should suggest the patient to wait in the waiting room after uh, the procedure. And which is the most important risk factor to develop a contrast media reaction, show the previous allergic reaction to intravascular contrast media is the major risk factor. And therefore the anamnesis of patient and the previous history of patient is really important to avoid other uh, important reaction. But we have also some other risk factors like the asthma, especially those asthma that requires medical treatment because the patient may deserve uh, of support to breath and also the atopy, that is the, uh, the, the basis of allergic reaction. But what we can do just to avoid any adverse reaction event, if, um, if we have an history of previous allergic event, we should consider an alternative test that not requires any iodinated contrast agent, like ultrasound with contrast agent or like MR, or we can uh, have a mind to use a different iodinated contrast agent. Moreover, in the literature, there is a, a debate about the role of the premedication because the international guidelines do not suggest to use the premedication because there is no clinical evidence of its effect effectiveness. And both for ESO and for ACR, 
Theoretically, the pre-medication can be useful only to prevent the less important for the moderate, moderate event, but not it's able to prevent the life-threatening condition. For this reason, it's not suggested anymore, but since the symptoms of allergy of uh, contrast media reaction is similar to the typical allergic reaction, we can try to premedicate the patient by using the typical drugs that are useful for the allergic reaction. So the premedication is based on the administration of corticosteroids and antihistamine drug. And if you want to use the premedication, uh, these are the typical approach. Uh, we suggest to inject 13 hours before, seven hours before, and one hour before the contrast CT procedure, 15 milligrams of hydrocortisone plus antihistamine drug, while for child we can use uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.7 milligrams per kilo, again 13 seven and one hour before the examination, and again combined with antihistamine in order only to prevent the mild reaction. But usually the correct treatment of an acute contrast reaction, depending on the clinical scenario that we can observe after, uh, after the administration of a contrast agent. And so now it's time to show you which would be the most correct treatment according to the different scenario. First of all, we have to look at the patient and look at the condition of the patient. We should understand if the patient is able to speak correctly, if it's able uh, to breathe in a correct way, and if the vital parameters does work correctly. And so what we can have, in case of mild reaction, the most typical symptoms could be represented by nausea and vomiting. And what we have to do in this case, we have to do nothing. We have only to watch the patient and reassure the patient. While in case of orticaria, rash, cutaneous rash, or itching, we have to discontinue the injection if it's not already completed. In some cases, no treatments are needed, but the best thing is to administer the antihistamine in an endovenous way to reduce the symptoms. While regarding the moderate reaction may present like dyspnea or bronchospasm, in this case, we have to support the ventilation by using or by giving oxygen via mask. We have to administer the beta agonist to improve the respiration, and we have obviously to monitor the electrocardiogram, the pulse oximeter, and the blood pressure. While if patients develop hypotension and tachycardia, we have to elevate the leg, the leg of 60 degrees or more, and we have to administer intravenously the Ringer's lactase or normal saline solution combined with atropine. And again, if patients develop marked urticaria, the basis of treatment is represented by antihistamine drug. If the mild or moderate event resolved by itself or by the drug, we have later to observe the patient until the, the patient symptoms are completely resolved in a dedicated area. And uh, as already said, we have to look at the patient for at least for 30 minutes. And obviously we have to offer to the patient some specific advice and specific instruction in case of uh, further need of medical support. So the patient must be addressed uh, to the emergency department just to take in care for further symptoms. While moving to the severe reaction, they may manifest as a laryngeal edema, convulsion, unresponsiveness, or cardiopulmonary arrest. And what we have to do in this case, really simple, we have to call for the resuscitation team and start the so-called ABC protocol, in which A stays for airway, B stays for breathing, and C stays for circulation. And so it means that we should support the ventilation with face mask or with AMBU. We have to administer a high amount of saline solution or ringer lactate. 
And the most important thing is to administer the adrenaline. This is the drug that will save the life of patient. And uh, this uh, combination has the absolute priority in everyday clinical practice. Usually, the deaths of course mainly to do a uh, delay in the administration of adrenaline because we are afraid to uh, use this drug with the severe uh, results in terms of life condition. But don't forget that until now, there is no absolute contraindication to the administration of adrenaline. And for this reason, we suggest to have only one concentration of adrenaline in the radiology department, because usually the radiologist may use the intramuscular way, while the anesthesiologist use the intravenous way. And I really suggest to use the syringe adrenaline pump that is really convenient to use in every in everyday clinical practice. And differently from those suggested from Kentin Tarantino, we should not use the myocardial muscle, but we use as site of injection the middle third of the tight by using the syringe that is really, really convenient. But in our emergency department, we should have a, ser uh, a series of drugs that can be really useful for the management of the adverse reaction. And so we should have a really well-prepared emergency cart that must contain oxygen, adrenaline, antihistamine, atropine, beta-2 agonist, obviously a large amount of fluids, and some support uh, uh, device, like the syringe, the needles, the sphygmomanometer, manometer, and the breather system. And what we have to do after the resolution of symptoms or after a severe uh, contrast media reaction, we have to perform a test for the evidence of allergy, and usually the skin test is highly suggested, highly suggested. And moreover, we have to record the reaction according to the law and to the legislatory rules of each country or of each hospital. And regarding the allergic test, by using the skin test, what we have to test? Sure, we have to test the used contrast agent with other several contrast agents in order to find out any possible cross reactivity. But what we have to know very well is that the skin tests offer very low sensitivity, but really high specificity. And for this reason, we cannot use uh, the skin test as a screening test in those patients that never experienced any prior reaction because the skin test in this case has no any uh, usefulness from a clinical point of view. And regarding the cross reactivity between the different iodinated contrast agents, the international guidelines and the Allergological Society uh, write a white paper uh, suggesting that the drugs in the group B, represented by yobitridol and deoxyglutate, are uh, those drugs that have the less amount of cross reactivity because the molecule is quite different in the structures if compared with uh, others uh, ionic or non-ionic contrast agent. Well, regarding the delayed reaction, usually they manifest as cutaneous one and they may develop 60 minutes after the contrast injection till one week later. Unfortunately, the real incidence of the lady reaction, it is not well known because in most of the cases, uh, they resolve by itself in the next day. And usually they are not brought to the attention of the radiologist. But which are the typical symptoms? They are manifested uh, like an orticaria, persistent rash, or macropapular exanthem. And since the basis of the reaction is the T cell mediated reaction, also in this case, we treat with antihistamine or with cortisone. But usually they are managed by emergency department or by other doctor out of radiologist. But to conclude, we can say that today, millions of intravascular contrast media examination are performed each year, and the adverse side effects are really unfrequent. 
And obviously, usually they have a relationship with the pre-existing condition of patient. So don't forget to take a good anamnesis in this patient. And this adverse side effect may vary and ranging from minor to severe life-threatening condition. And we have to know how to treat them in the correct way. And we should be prepared with the emergency card and with our knowledge that should, that should be renewed every year. And obviously the emergency training and equipment is essential. To do this, don't forget to follow the ISO guidelines for Europe or the American College of Radiology guidelines that uh, help us manage the patient in correct way, both for iodinated contrast agent and for gadolinium ones. And now I would like to thank you for the kind attention. Thank you very much for this nice overview. We are proud of what to do. Yeah. Well, you need to know what to do. You give us a very comprehensive uh, talk. You have simplified uh, your talk. In a, so you, you serve us with a, a, an easy way. And also, you give clear messages. It's important that we, and every radiology, you this professional life, something is. So uh, instead of panic, it's good to have all these things in a simple way in your mind because you cannot learn it during the panic. Exactly. We have to learn before, but I think that adrenaline is a good support just in the worst cases. And obviously, you have the resuscitation team and the anesthesiology on call at each time, and they will save you if you are really afraid about the events. And there are also issues where energy is given by itself without reducing. So no, it's already too good. So the screening is the best approach. Yeah. It's simple. You know what? Yes, it leaves about two years or three, so you can maintain the fish and then you see him in a bit. But also the breath support and the side support in the corticosteroid can be used for during the emergency. And in some cases, the patient may have this mare and hypotension. And our anesthesiology suggests us the so called wallet position in order to increase the pressure and facilitate the, the breathing of patient. So you have to arrange and work according to different uh, scenarios day by day. But I think that adrenaline, oxygen, and histamine and cortical steroids are the best thing that you could know. <laughs> For pre medication, I, I, uh, most, I was more familiar with the two days pre medication scheme. But as you saw us, it's not necessary. You can start uh, 13 hours before we can do some of the evening before the examination. So, but now, and this is not, yes, not very good to give two days. Uh, in our experience, it works because we do not have any severe event. So, really, we don't know if the pre medication works well or not. But we know that. Most of the cases. But, you know, sometimes there are medical issues. And the judge will ask you what you have done to, to prevent it. So it's, it's, it's important to give you. Yeah, sure, sure. And it is such a low dose, uh, only for three times before examination, it's harmless. Yeah. Almost harmless. Yeah, for most of the cases. So I do agree with you. Uh, is there any, any question? The audience from those that are uh, connected? Sure. Any comment? Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask just uh, to make sure uh, in one slide where you said uh, that it was written that uh, previous allergies to mollusks uh, should be considered. Uh, is the, that correct? Because the guidelines changed last year. Okay. And the previous guidelines suggest uh, to avoid the mollusk and okay. fish uh, allergy, but now it's not suggested anymore. No, it's not suggested. Yes, yeah. but you, it's better from an, uh, to take the correct anamnesis because if the patient has an allergy, yeah, maybe so you have uh, yeah, more chance to develop an allergic reaction. So okay. they are not, they do not suggest, but it's in the better context to of atopy. Yes, exactly. In the okay. context of atopy. Yes. Okay. yes. So yeah. Yes. 
still have an unplanned series of unplanned reaction and then take the same indication. Theoretically, you could develop this one because the histamine may interact in a different way and cause a severe reaction, but till now nobody knows the real incidence because there are no significant study with very large amount of patients. So I think that in the next year, maybe we'll change again the guidelines, maybe the recommendation will be suggested again. Because uh, three years ago, the years before, uh, there was a an, an, an great impact on implementation, it was I suggested. Now, since there's no specific study, they decided to cancel it or to not give a legal value. But I think in the future, that some center will start to, to evaluate the development of some uh, severe reaction after communication and could be changed. But now we don't know, we don't really know. I think that it works. My personal opinion, if you use corticosteroid and histamine, in some cases you will use severity as well, severity. But it's on my, my mind. Think about it. And let's go. Okay. Change. Yes, we change totally the talk okay. now. We are moving from something that is quite new, again, in everyday clinical practice. And I'll talk in the next 30 minutes about the new model based reconstruction algorithm in CT imaging. And I'll try to show you which is the technical background and if the model based may offer any uh, added clinical value in everyday clinical practice. Well, as we know, the computer tomography use has increased dramatically over uh, the past a few decades due to the improvements in terms of sensitivity and quality of cross-sectional imaging. But, but unfortunately, at the same time, we assist to a significant increase of radiation dose exposure for patients. And for this reason today, all of the radiologists must work in line with the so-called ALARA principle that suggests us to use the low radiation dose as possible, but maintaining the best quality of image as possible. And according to the ALARA principle, in the last 15 years, we use several techniques to reduce or to control the radiation dose, like the application of a single contrastographic phase, like arterial or portal beams one. But so we know that in some context, in some clinical scenario, we need more than one contrastographic phase or we tried in the past to modify the acquisition parameters, like the KV, the MIS, section thickness, pitch, and so on. But unfortunately, this approach is uh, time demanding and is not reliable from a clinical point of view. And the, for this reason, the last years of the vendors tried to support us by introducing the so-called automated exposure control that modulates the MIS according to the shape of patients according to the body habitus. And another great intro, uh, clinical introduction was the use of hybrid eye therapy algorithm that it's able to reduce the noise from our st standard imaging, starting from FBP, moving to the image domain that they are able to correct the amount, the amount of uh, not only of radiation dose, but of uh, noise also. And so they allow us to work with uh, low MIS, but maintaining a high diagnostic quality, starting from our FBP. But the most recent approach to, and obviously all of the vendors now suggest and use the hybrid therapy approach in their CT scanner. So they represent till now the state of the art in everyday clinical practice. But the most recent approach to control the radiation dose in CT imaging are represented by the spectral CT approach. And last year we already had a talk about this topic and the new model-based iterative reconstruction algorithm. The model-based work in a different way because it uses the so-called knowledge-based approach and it is able to remodel the reconstruction process of data both in the image domain and the projection domain in order to minimize the differences between the measured raw data, sorry, 
the measured raw data, and the estimated final imaging, producing the so-called virtual noise-free images. In more simple way, the software is able to work according to the knowledge of radiation dose of the system geometry and regarding the diffusivity of radiation dose. Then he compared the images, with the results, with the standard images because he has inside a modelization of different anatomical structures and the combination of, of both knowledge uh, will produce a new way of images that is totally completely different from the past. Because when we work with the hybrid iterative approach, we started from FBP, we work only in the image domain, and we were able to clean the excess of noise. But now we have no more information regarding the FBP, and therefore the final images is totally different from the past and maybe represent a challenge for uh, the radiologist. And again, most of the vendors now are able and offer this kind of model reconstruction algorithm, while in the future we are waiting for the deep learning algorithm based on AI. And uh, the next uh, 30 minutes, I'll try to show which are the physical basis of model base, represented by the dose reduction, thickness reduction, and testing the image quality. And later we'll check regarding the quality, the, regarding the clinical value of the model-based approach. So it's time to jumping in, in the physical concept. Till now, we are still used to work with 100 KB setting because it represents a good compromise between the radiation dose and the final quality of the images. So if we try to reconstruct this set of images with the model-based approach, we try to clean something that is already clean. And so in clinical practice, we have no any added value because we will obtain a plastic effect that is not reliable or usable in everyday clinical practice. But if we try to work with 100 or with 80 kV, we increase significantly the amount of noise. And now we can try to take the advantage of applying a model-based approach and now we are able to obtain a new way of images that is totally clean from excess of noise. And so we work in line with 120 dB, but we use a lower dose, but the, the final image will be the same. And which are the consequences of working with the low KV approach? First, we will able to reduce significantly the radiation dose delivered to the patient but we increase obviously also the image model that may uh, degrade the image quality, but the model-based approach will uh, improve the final quality. But I think that the most important thing to remember is that working with the low KV approach, we will able to approach the k edge of iodine. And so it means that we are, are able to increase the conspicuity of iodine and the contrast noise ratio of our set of images. And let me show you a typical example. The same patient was evaluated with 120 kV setting and with 80 kV setting. So moving from 120 to lower value, the attenuation of iodine increase, and therefore what is bright becomes brighter. And this way, we are more able to recognize the focal lesion in different organs because we are able to differentiate better each different structures. And for this reason, the organs that may benefit more from model-based approach are those organs in which we have a great difference in terms of absolute attenuation values, like in the lung, where we have the air, and we have the soft tissue and bones as well, or most important, in the angiographic study. Because in the angiography CT, we have the high attenuation of contrast agents compared to low attenuation values of surrounding structures. Another physical problem is represented by the quality of the images. Till now, we know that working with FBP or with hybrid iterative uh, algorithm, increasing the thickness of the images, we increase the final quality of the image 
uh, itself because we have more data to compute, we have more information, and so increasing the thickness is really important to increase the value, the diagnostic value. While, again, if we work with a model-based approach, if we try to increase the thickness in order to improve the quality of images, we try to clean something that is already clean. And so we have no clinical benefit. For this reason, when we work with model-based, we should use a very thinner slices, while when we work with FBP or with hybrid approach, we should work with very thicker slices. And what means from a clinical point of view? If we work in the brain domain, from the axial native, native images, we are able to reconstruct them in sagittal, coronal, or in another uh, multiplanar reformatted way. And so we have a really volumetric approach that is totally different from the past. But I think that now it's time to move to show some clinical cases. This was a patient that was addressed to our emergency department due to a brain trauma, underwent an enhanced CT scan, and we reconstructed the raw data both with hybrid iterative and with model-based. We evaluated the images with uh, only with one millimeter thickness and comparing the results, I think that everybody agrees with me that the quality is superior with model-based. We have a better differentiation between gray and white matter. We have a better delineation of the convolution and the less amount of texture. And if we try to look at some specific disease, like this hot spot, hemorrhagic hot spots, is more evident and clear in model based if compared with the therapy one. But the same results can be obtained also in the abdominal domain. This was a patient, again addressed to emergency department due to abdominal pain, already underwent ultrasound examination, suspected for biliary uh, disease. Unfortunately, with ultrasound, we are not able to evaluate the distal tract of the biliary system, and therefore the patient was addressed for CT scan. And here we are looking at coronal images reconstructed again with hybrid approach, you know, with model-based approach, again with one, with one millimeter thickness. I think that, again, comparing the results, the amount of noise is really lower in the model base. Even if we work with one millimeter thickness, we have a better differentiation between the biliary tract uh, if compared to surrounding parenchyma. And looking at the stones, we have a better delineation of the pathological disease if compared with hybrid one. But if we want to know if the model base works in the correct way, we should uh, test it in something that is outside from our organ. And to understand if the model base give the truth, we should test the air around the patient because usually the air should not have any texture. And so what we can do, we can draw a region of interest in the air around the patient we can measure the standard deviation of our security units. And moving from iterative to model-based one, we assist a reduction of more than 50% of noise. So if I ask you, does the air around the patient have any texture or not? I think that everybody agrees with me that the air should not have any texture. And the same approach could be done inside the human body trying to testing another component that should not have any texture, like the fluid or the content of a urinary bladder. And again, drawing a region of interest, we reduce the standard deviation of more than 40%. So I think that the model based is more close to the truth if compared to hybrid approach. And so to summarize this first part of the presentation, I can try to reconstruct my standard liver imaging in coronal plane with one millimeter thickness. I use the iterative system. And now I can try to blow away the dust and this will be the final results. A new fantastic way of images with better delineation of the different organs of the different components and the angioma lesion is more clear and more evident if compared to standard hybrid one.
But now I would like to summarize the history of a CT reconstruction algorithm by using the eyes of painter. And obviously I'll try to use a typical Italian view represented by the Venice Arbor. And I start with Monet, that was an impressionist. And uh, his technique was full of uh, noise or full of pixel. And so was quite similar to FBP. We know that, is, that the city is Venice. This is the Arbor. It's quite close to the reality, but it's not the truth. So we can move to another painter that's called Canaletto. He was a Vedutist, and his technique was completely different because he wants to reply the reality at his best. And so the final results is closest to the two. And we can compare these results with the iterative reconstruction algorithm. But till now, if I try to do it by myself, Sure, I'm not a painter, I'm not so able, and so I will use my mobile phone, and this will be the final results. Sure, it's less romantic, but was the closest if compared with the truth. And therefore, the technology can be compared to the model-based approach. Well, but now it's time, I think, to looking at the possible clinical advantage of this new technique in everyday clinical practice. And again, let's start with an, an example of a patient uh, with brain trauma. Again, an enhanced CT scan. And we are used to work uh, before 2019 with the iterative algorithm by using four millimeter thickness, according to the international literature. While after introducing the model base, we start working with two millimeters in the brain domain. And I think that in both of models, we are able to perform the correct diagnosis. We can recognize the subdural hematoma in the right temporal bone and the subarachnoid hemorrhage in the left frontal area. But if we try to look deeply inside the imaging, zooming in the images, I think that everybody agrees with me that the spatial resolution, the contrast noise ratio, and the delineation of the disease is more evident when we work with model based because we can better differentiate the bone from the blood, from the edema, and from surrounding normal parenchyma. But let's move to another example. Again, another brain trauma. The patient underwent an enhanced CT scan. And looking at the left frontal bone, we can recognize this small rounding hyperattenuating alteration that could be in line with the partial volume effect because it's quite slight or could be an hemorrhagic alteration, while no significant findings are evident in the posterior fossa. What we can do now, we can try to reconstruct the images with model based, and now every, everything becomes clear. The hemorrhagic alteration is more evident, so we increase our confidence with the final diagnosis, and we have more slices to analyze the hemorrhagic component. And looking again deeply inside the images, we can appreciate one more hemorrhagic focus on the posterior fossa, on the right cerebellum, and we are able to better recognize also the surrounding edema that was not so clear when we use the hybrid iterative one. Let's move to another domain, like the abdominal domain. In this case, we are evaluating a patient with uh, suspected for a stones of the kidney tract. In our standard clinical practice, we were used to work in, uh, to, with two millimeters thickness with hybrid approach. While when we move to the model-based approach, we start working with 0 0.8 millimeters with model-based. And again, comparing the results of images, the calcification on the right kidney becomes brighter, more evident, and we increase our confidence in the final diagnosis also for this small calcification, this small stone of the distal tract of the ureter. And we are looking in a deeper images, both for the axial native one and for the MPR reformatted in different plane. So finally, if we work with the thin slices, we have a better contrast noise ratio. And another really great example of a patient that was addressed the emergency department due to source for suspicion of pulmonary hemorrhage underwent uh, angiographic CT study of the lung. And here we have a new way of images. We are able to recognize the blood inside the alveoli 
We are able to recognize the interlocular sector. We are able to recognize the small bronchi and obviously the vascular structures. And what we do in clinical practice now, we can obtain a result that is quite similar to the pathological examination by using a standard CT scan. And regarding the dose, I would like to show you this example of a patient with a known urinary bladder cancer on the right side wall that underwent several follow-up. In this case, we are comparing the results from two different CT scanners. One equipped with the hybrid aetherity uh, algorithm, the other one was equipped with model-based. And what happened that by using the, multi, the same multiphasic approach, we obtain the same results. We are able to perform the correct diagnosis. We are able to recognize this other small tumor. But if we look at the total radiation dose, we will able to reduce it of more than 48%. Because now we work with 100 kV in all of the patients, if compared with the past when we work with 120. And moving in the upper part of the abdomen of the same patient, again, if we try to look at the very tiny structures, we can better appreciate the version duct and the differences between version surrounding pancreatic parenchyma and the vascular structures. So even if we work at thinner slices, the final result is better. And let me show another example of a patient with the lymphoproliferative disease that again underwent several uh, CT scan. We acquired only the portal venous phase. And if we, if we try to look at the simple cyst of kidney, again, we recognize the significant reduction of texture, better image quality. And again, if we try to look at the pancreatic gland, I think that this small IPMN of the body of pancreas is more evident when we work with model-based, if compared with hybrid approach. And again, if we try to look at the dose, we were able to save almost the 44% of radiation dose, increasing the final quality of images. So, which are the benefits of model-based? It allows us to work with the really low noise images. We can modify our CT protocol, and so we can start working with low dose approach. And the final result, is the high level contrast detectability. And for this reason, in our clinical practice, we modify all of the standard protocol, like in the angiographic study or in the coronary CTA. Now, in all of the patients, we work with ATKV, except for those with a really high body mass index, uh, more than 30. In all of the cases, we use only 60 or 50 milliliters of iodinated contrast. And by using a dose that range from 0.5 to 1 millisievert, this is the final result. High level of diagnostic images, well delineation of the vascular structures, multiplanar and volumetric assessment at once by using only a few amount of radiation dose. And the same results uh, can be quite evident when we measure or we draw a region of interest inside the coronary artery. With the low KB approach, we can increase the absolute value of attenuation inside the coronary artery vessel. In this case, it's more than 800. And we know that the literature suggests us a cutoff value of 300 to uh, Qual, uh, to define as optimal quality for CTA. And in other angiographic domain, we modify our protocol. In all of the cases of those patient candidates for tummy planning or for angiographic study, we use 80 KB setting and 50 milliliters of iodinated contrast as usual with two contrastographic phase, and we are able to obtain an homogeneous opacification of vessels with very good anatomical detail. And the absolute attenuation values is quite uniform from the upper part of the aorta till the femoral branches. And obviously also in the pulmonary embolism domain, we change the protocol. Again, we work with 50 or with 40 milliliters now with ATKV in all of the patient. So we are able to obtain a very high attenuation values inside the vessel and very very high anatomical detail.
And one of the domain that uh, can take an advantage from the model base, sure, is represented by the land domain. Now we can try to look at very subtle attenuation inside the parenchyma, like this simple bulla or emphysematous lesion that can be recognizable both with I am with a hybrid iterative, but I think that with model based, they are more evident. And again, the amount of texture is significantly reduced. And this is especially clear when we work with interstitial fibrotic lung disease, like the UIP, the usual interstitial pneumonia. This is the standard algorithm with hybrid approach. Again, if we try to apply the model based, we're starting to clean the images, and so we can better recognize the typical sign of uh, WIP represented by the on a combing, the high amount of cyst in multiple layers. Or also the bone domain can take advantage of using model based approach. In this case, we are studying a young patient that underwent endorthesis on the right talus and evaluating both angle, both angle at once, really wide range volume. We work with a very, really low dose that it's comparable to a standard multiple X-ray projection for both angles. But which is the most important thing? If we try to look around uh, the metallic uh, uh, device, we have no significant beaming artifact due to the model that is able to clean the excess of noise. And so now I would like to show you my mood when I was a young resident. I was really excited by volumetric approach, by 3D images and multipanel reconstruction. But now everything is changed because I'm more confident with myself. I know that I can look deeply into images and find out something, something that it's really useful from a clinical point of view. And I think that now you are wondering if model-based approach can really modify the management of patient after CT scan. And again, let me show you some example. In this case, we are looking at patient with a known ovarian cancer that underwent several follow-up just to exclude the relapse of disease and looking at the images with hybrid approach with coronal plane, we can recognize this simple cyst and this lightly hypothermating alteration uh, along the right diaphragm in line with uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis. The patient has a free fluid, but looking at this set of images, the patient should undergo surgical treatment, removing the neoplastic nodule. But now what we can do, again, we can try to reconstruct the same set of images with model-based approach. And again, everything becomes clear. We are not now able to recognize a multiple hyper-attenuating alteration along the diaphragm in line with the calcification, and so in line with typical peritoneal carcinomatosis, we are able to better recognize this metastatic lesion and this other one. And so at the end, we moved from surgical approach to the chemotherapeutic approach. And looking at the details, they are more evident with model based, especially for those tiny calcification. And also looking at the native axial images, again, moving from one technique to the newest one, we can better appreciate the uh, thickening of the right diaphragm and also the metastatic alteration is clear with model based if compared hybrid approach. Another case of patient that uh, was addressed to our center due to a thoracic pain, suspected for myocardial ischemia, underwent coronary CTA. And here we are looking at the results obtained with hybrid iterative approach. In this case, we use 100 kV. And along the right side wall of the left anterior descending, we can appreciate this nomogeneity that is no longer recognizable in the MPR on paracoronal plane or in the pure axial plane. So we are in trouble about the final diagnosis. What we can do, 
we can try to reconstruct the images with model based. And again, now I'm more confident with the final diagnosis because I can differentiate the fat from the soft tissue from the artery. And so we can increase our final diagnosis making the positive remodeling and so the patient deserves some drug treatment in order to avoid any myocardial event with more confidence if compared with hybrid therapy. And another really funny case, because this was a cardiac surgeon of my center, that due to some a specific symptom underwent CTA, but unfortunately he made a deep breath and we acquired the uncorrect angiographic phase because it was perfect for coronary artery and not adequate for the aorta and for coronary itself. What we can do? Again, we can reconstruct the images with model based. We can clean the excess of noise. We are able to look at the absolute attenuation values. That is really higher, it's almost 500. We are able to perform the multiplanar images in a parasagittal plane. But the most important thing is that we move from negative left anterior descending uh, to positive one. Here we can better recognize this tiny soft plaque that deserve some medical treatment with different level of model-based approach. We can confirm the final diagnosis. So again, we move from negative to positive. And let me show other example regarding other domains. In this case, the patient was uh, addressed to emergency department for brain CT scan because he had in a recent history a right syndrome. And we know that in this case, we have to point out and rule out the presence of any possible thrombosis on Willis polygon. And we know that the typical sign is the hyperdense artery sign that is due to the high amount of protein that stay inside the vessel. And as we can compare in this case, we are able to perform the correct diagnosis, but the model base has an intrinsic added clinical value. But now I would like to show you a more challenging case. We are uh, looking for patients with the left syndrome, that again underwent an enhanced CT scan. Again, we are looking only on the Willis polygon, and we cannot say anything. No disease, no hyperthermating alteration. So the patient can be classified as negative. But what we can do? We can try to reconstruct the images with model based. We can look at the right celebrate artery, and we are able to recognize this hyperattenuating thrombus in the medium and distal tract. So the same set of raw data, but a different reconstruction model. We would like to confirm the thrombosis. We performed the angiographic study that demonstrated the complete occlusion of the distal, of the medium and distal tract of the right cerebral artery. And eight hours later, the patient developed a huge ischemic area in a temporal and parietal lobe. So again, we move from something that is negative to something that is positive. And now let me show the very last example. This was a patient addressed to the emergency department due headache during the New Year's Eve nights. At that time, our colleague was not so get used uh, working with model based. And so they analyzed only the iterative reconstruction algorithm report the images as negative, and for this reason, the patient was discharged and went home. But one week later, the patient came back to the hospital due to a coma status, underwent an enhanced CT that is showing this huge hemorrhagic component in the temporal lobe. And after the angiography study, we make the diagnosis of uh, uh, middle salivary artery aneurysm a rupture and developing of a uh, big lake of hemorrhage. What we can do, in this case, we can try to relook at the set of images that was already constructed with model-based and trying to compare the results 
the aneurysm was already recognizable, but at that time we were not so confident with the model based if compared with iterity. And freezing the images, I think that everybody agrees with me that the aneurysm was really more evident. And again, in this case, we theoretically could be able to prevent the, the, um, the, the un unpleasant event represented by the hemorrhage uh, of hemorrhage of brain. So today we use the model based as a standard reconstruction algorithm for every CT examination because we assisted to a significant improvement in the diagnostic performance of the radiologist in terms of sensitivity and of management of patients. And again, I would like to thank you for the attention and I hope you enjoy with this challenging case. Thank you for this spectacular uh, and agreements uh, are impressive and uh, really convincing. Because uh, there is no reason uh, for the manufacturers to improve their machines to add the new rows and all. So, with the same data, you can get uh, increasingly better results. And the images uh, that we can show to us are. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, is there any question or comment? Yeah, yes, uh, and I'm not a specialist in this thing, so uh, okay. whoever resident here. Um, this is a special software. Is this a software just one uh, provider? Uh, can we have this in any CT uh, yes. device? Uh, so now all of the vendors may offer this software, but now they are changing from model base that is more uh, hardware demanding because it needs uh, more than one means to reconstruct the images to a new one that's called deep learning or AI based images that use the same approach. When they reduce the amount of noise, they use a uh, modelizer. Uh, they use the knowledge of the anatomical structures and they allow us to modify the protocol but obtain the best results with the learnings. But no, so we have uh, all of the possibilities for the base and the learning for all of the vendors. And this is uh, the real contribution, the state of the art. Yeah, unfortunately, we are today. So, and this is the reconstruction you can get. You just said it needs a little more time. Yes. So, how do you reduce the doses if you already have done it? That uh, number of KV. Uh, uh, you have to modify it before. before. Ah, okay. Okay. So for all of patients, you work with 100. 100, not 80. 80 for a young patient or for the very tiny, regarding the abdomen and the lung. One for the endogram study, 80 can be for all of the cases. So, so if you have the software, you can uh, move to apply one number of KVs, yes. get your normal images, and then get it through the model based technique and have an improved machine. Yes. But you need more time and experience. Yes, uh, at least uh, I think you need three months or four months to. So, become used uh, working with model based. But it, it is more uh, uh, um, an issue for the old radiologists because my residents are not yet used to work with the MVP. Yes, they learn the clean images without any noise. And they ask me why we want to look at the hybrid one or when we look at the images from other hospital. They are not really <laughs> used on it. Because it's totally different. They are really, really different. And so I think that in the future, all of the deep learning system, all of the vector will suggest a modelized approach. So it's, 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 it's correct to say that the, the model based approach is the first step for the physical therapy? Yes, yes. And uh, yeah. when the physical therapy comes in everyday practice, we probably we would have. Um, Better model based approach yes. with even more less uh, noise and 
more clear image. Is there anything to lose with this uh, progress? Or is not only on the on games? Theoretically, we should be having at all the games, but uh, I yet to try. We have to almost uh, start the first Italian deep learning system from Philips. And so we will test and we will try to understand that if uh, it offers the same information or more, because having a different city scatter, we can compare the results and follow up and decide if it really works. We try to do what we have did with the model based. At the beginning, we worked with 120 KB, the one was happy about that. We looked at the protocol, we compared the results with the previous one, we were really happy. But now we have to. So that's what the most approach is in the gray zone because you can yes. control or impact. So I think uh, this is going to count probably if you can. Yes. You have no control. I don't think so because the artificial intelligence is not artificial, it's a, a faint word because the human is in charge to, to teach and train the artificial intelligence. It means that uh, I have some. Uh, like uh, some slide, uh, usually the uh, city developer look at tons of uh, previous city, and then they compare the results of previous city with the results of uh, artificial intelligence, and then the artificial intelligence, according to the standard anatomy, like a model, they start to pin the images, the excessive noise. So theoretically, it's an information. I think it works like on the phone. Uh, in Telegram by phone. Ten years ago, the picture was not so good. We were used to the, the camera, but now the value is in uh, the camera and we can go on the by phone because the camera is always good. You can modify whatever you want. It's portable, it's fast. So I think it's more or less is the is the same. Uh, if you want to in your USB or no, no, in the IMR, yeah. if you want to make sure what's what to do. If you go at the end, I'm just studying, so I'm not so confident with the topic. But what the software do now is acquiring the raw data, clean the images, and produce the images. But now this process uh, will be done a lot of time for the intelligence. So we analyze, we analyze, we analyze till to obtain the results that is quite similar to that ever mind. And uh, so we have the low quality data with the future that are compared with the high quality data. So we have a very old training system and artificial intelligence is in between trying to compare one information with all this one. So what do the artificial intelligence is that? Should recognize which the correct number of polygons, and compare it. More or less. So, I think that we should not have this contradiction because it's not words by team. It's a, a, it's a box that is ready, so it cannot improve by itself in the future. So, it's not a real vision that what we learn. But they call it. Yeah. That's not a major decision. Yeah, yeah. So, there's a lot of information. Deep learning yeah. provides. Uh, so, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's time now to buy such a software or wait for it. I think we have to wait because, because we're we're to work with me and we have to start with the time. Okay. I, I think that the uh, artificial intelligence, the final results will be similar to what we because most of people are really used to look only at FDP. And so, can be more convenient for the human eyes. But the now I prefer the model based in the process, especially when you are starting with the Android and when you are setting the AI. And you get a very significant downgrade of the process. Yeah, yeah. it's very significant. Most of the we will use Compass agent to save money. And those are for patients. I think what does you say? Uh, in the underground study, from 30% uh, to 70%. Okay. 
He's not sure. Um, I mean, all of uh, our Kasari who was sitting in the list for all of Asian with 3.5 low rates in a cardiac uh, 50 or 60, but we use a low concentration of iodine on this media. We don't, yes, because we are more we more power. Power. exactly so we can save part of the money because it costs less. And uh, in the Bombayaka, we and now I use 40 or 30 when I have my emergency machine. I uh, use a really low compensation. Yes, there is somebody who's on the speed here. Yeah, <laughs> but they are really add it because uh, the literature said as a new identification to make the best uh, cardiac thing. Now we can use a very low situation uh, to take the same result. So, for a company, I'm not happy, and the companies are going to be happy about this result. So, the kidneys are happy. The kidneys are really happy. Yeah. <laughs> also. So, any other question or comment from the audience or those that are connected? connected? So, thank you, thank you very, very much. Nice. We remember that we, we enjoyed the discussion with us. We're giving all this uh, knowledge in a, in a very, in a very good way. In a very, very I hope that it's simple. Uh, 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 a good speaker to give uh, simple uh, guidelines and simple messages. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure.